Hello, I'm Alan, and I'm so thankful that you're here. We've been talking about the body of Christ and really finding our place in the body of Christ. How do we get God to place us in the position that he's destined for us to be in? Now, we've been comparing chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians to chapter 13, and today we're going to focus on chapter 13, uh, the love chapter. And, and I hope I've shown to you that a lot of what's in chapter 13 has to do with maturing to that new nature of love, the fruit of love in you. Um, so before we go to chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, we're going to focus on chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians. So come with me to chapter 3, and we'll look at verse 18. And here Paul's writing about the new covenant, the new relationship we have through the new covenant. In verse 18, he says this, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So I want us to look at this verse and begin to see the imagery and the picture that's in here, because we're going to lay this verse on chapter 13, and it'll help you answer many questions. Uh, the first part, he says, mirror, the word mirror. Uh, in King James, sometimes it uses the word uh, glass dimly. But if you look at the Greek, it's referring to a mirror. A mirror is something you look at and you see a reflection of yourself. So in verse 18, he says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed. The Greek word here is metamorphosis. It's transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So here he's given us an indication of the new relationship that you have with Christ once you're born again. That you can look in a mirror. If you're looking for how to transform into being a child of God, a mature child of God. It starts with looking in a mirror. When I look at a mirror, I'm not looking to heaven. I'm not looking uh, in a book. I'm looking at a reflection of myself. And what he's saying here is that there, there is a an nature of Christ in you. Now that you're born again, you have a new nature. The seed of Christ is in you. And if you splice open that new nature, that seed, you'll find in it an image of Jesus Christ in all of his maturity and holiness and love. And that is in the nature that you have inside of you in your inner man once you're born again. So now all I have to do if I want to transform is to take that image of Christ which I find in me once I'm born again and I can begin to bring forward that image as fruit, love, joy, peace of Christ in me. We call that maturing to the love in the new nature. So, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So this is where we want to focus, where does love come from? Where does the love of Christ come from? Much in the church world, the modern church is focusing on you doing things in your love in the name of Jesus. But this is specifically talking about the very same love that Jesus had. The love of Christ uh, can be yours. It can develop in you to where you love exactly like Jesus loved. You have peace exactly like Jesus had peace. And when people meet you, they don't meet Alan's love. They don't meet your love. They meet the love of Christ in us. And that's the goal of God in our transformation. In love and holiness and peace and joy and long-suffering, all the attributes of Jesus, you have the same nature in you now that you can develop those. And that's the transformation process. We'll go over to chapter 4, verse 1, the next verse. Therefore, because we have this new nature in us, therefore, since we have this ministry, what's our ministry, Brother Allen? Do I pray for the sick? Do I 
uh, feed the poor. Yes, those are all good things. But really here, your ministry is doing what he said in verse 18, and that is transforming into that image of Christ in you. Uh, therefore, since we have this ministry of transformation, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. Now, you only tell people not to lose heart if, it's, if you can get um, tired of it. If the process isn't instantly, it takes time. Someone going to the gym to, to get in shape, after a month they can be discouraged and they can say, I worked out all month and I only lost like 0.1 pound. <laughs> you can say, well, do not lose heart. Just keep going. Well, it's the same ministry of transformation is that should be our focus as a Christian to grow up in the love of God, to develop the love of Christ in us so we can be like Christ in every aspect to the world. And in that, do not lose heart. Come to verse 16 of chapter 4. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inner man is being renewed day by day. So you can see that the transformation process is not just growing up the inner man, it's also mortifying the outward man, uh, having the outward man perishing day after day. Many modern churches are focused on celebrating the outward man, the outward emotions, the outward intellect in the name of Jesus. But transformation is the process of mortifying the outward man and building up the inward man. Now, how does that have to do with me getting into the body of Christ, my place in the body of Christ? Let's go over to 1 Corinthians. Uh, I'll read our, one of our core verses here. Uh, chapter 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal as to babes in Christ. So Paul here crosses a dividing line of Christianity. He basically, basically says there's two types of Christians that are going to heaven. One is carnal and immature. The other is spiritual. So spiritual here does not mean someone who has dreams and visions and uh, can prophesy or walk in uh, anointing. Uh, that's not what he calls spiritual. Because all of that was happening in the church of Corinth, the, the experiences of the move of God, but there was a lack of maturity. They were, they were being carnal, and God was working in their midst. So spiritual people here, according to Paul, are those who have developed the love of Christ in them and have focused on transformation as their ministry, growing up in God. So I'm saying all this because I want to see you in your calling. Most of our prayer requests that we receive in our ministry are usually for people having needs that they're struggling with, health, finances, family problems, emotional battles, that type of thing. But a large majority of the people who contact us for prayer are asking for advice on how do I get God to use me? I want to be part of the family of God, part of the kingdom of God, um, part of the body of Christ. How do I get God to promote me? Well, that's the reason I'm teaching this message, because you can do it through your calling and through the gifts of the Spirit and remain carnal, but never experience all that God has for you. But through the love of God, the more excellent way uh, through developing that love of Christ in you, you'll find that you'll have more of God and He will begin to place you in the body of Christ, specifically your place in the body of Christ. Now, I remember <clears throat> going to Nicar Nicaragua one time uh, with a bunch of Bible school students. I took them down there and we were preaching at different places and helping with uh, some of the Christian schools and some of the ministries there. And one night I got to go preach in Managua. And I'll never forget it because they gave me a car, uh, kind of a little little car with a, a back seat, a little pickup truck. And uh, with the back, little back seat, and there was a, 
a uh, young boy that came with me. He was my interpreter. And there was a sweet elderly lady, a little short lady. I think her name was Ruby. And she sat and she gave me directions. And we were driving and the boy would interpret. And I, I can't forget it because it was my first time driving in, uh, in like a Latin country. And it was crazy. The cars were packed. And, and, and the, the, the lady said, just honk and turn. That's how you go. You just honk and change lanes. And because you had to fight for every inch on the road, it was so packed. We're in Managua. And I finally got to this little church, and it was a little tiny group of people, about 20 people all to the, together. And the place we were at had a kind of one wall. It had a, uh, a two by four going across the top. There was no ceiling, no roof, uh, and a little light bulb had drop, dropped down. And that was the light that I was preaching at that as it became night. And as I was preaching, the light bulb went out and the electricity turned out in the neighborhood. So they all, it must have happened all the time because they quickly lit candles <laughs> and, and I carried on preaching by candlelight. But as I preached, I remembered uh, having a prayer line for healing. And uh, we had people come up for prayer. And there's one lady, the young lady brought brought towards me her baby. And she was holding her baby. And her baby was sick. And her baby had a fever. And she asked me to pray for her baby. And I remember her putting that baby in my arms. And I could feel the heat of the baby coming through, even that the heat of, of uh, Nicaragua that night. And um, I prayed with every bit of prayer I could. Uh, I squeezed every ounce of faith to see that baby healed. And at the end, I had to give the baby back. And I did not see any change in the baby after I had prayed and spoken and believed and, and uh, confessed and gave the baby back to the mom. And I remember leaving that service going home, being really quite discouraged and frustrated. Because here I am representing Jesus, believing for miracles, and had seen, at that time, already seen miracles in my ministry. But why is it I had a little baby of innocence that I couldn't see anything change? Now, I could be a, a good faith preacher and say, well, the baby got healed, we just didn't see it till later. And I pray that's what happened. But I can't confirm that. And, and see, when I pray for people, I take it personal. I get personal, personally connected to each person that I pray for because I want to see the truth of the Word of God happen in their life. Um, I could be a, a bad faith preacher and say, well, it's the baby's fault. The baby must have uh, been mean to the mama or cried too much and God just didn't heal it. I could be a bad faith preacher and say, well, it's the mama's fault. She didn't have enough faith. She didn't believe. Or I can be a really bad faith preacher and say, well, it was God's choice. He wanted to leave that baby sick to teach it a lesson, to teach the mama a lesson. God doesn't heal. I can make all kinds of excuses uh, to try to not focus on me. But I wanted to be honest with God. And I said, God, why could that baby not be healed? What was the problem? I know it wasn't the baby. I was representing Jesus. I was the preacher of the faith preacher speaking about God's healing. I, can't, I won't blame the mama because she came to me. So she came to me, irregardless of where she was at, I should have enough faith to see this baby healed instantly. And, and the Lord just gently told me, I said, God, I want to know where the problem was that stopped your healing power from healing this baby. And the Lord spoke to me and said, just gently, but he just said it, there was too much of Alan in the way. Well, I knew instantly what he meant. He meant that there was too much of me in the way, not too much, uh, not sin, not drinking or smoking or fornicating or any of that stuff, just too much of Alan in the way. And, and, and see, I look back and I can understand it so much better now. 
that I have an outward man that is in the way. Outward thinking, outward motivated. My outward man needs to be mortified and my inner man must develop and grow into the things of Christ. It's not all automatic. Now, what is automatic is when you're saved, you receive that new nature and it's complete. But also you receive a new inner man that is quickened. That inner man is is where the knowledge of God goes. That's where faith really comes from. That's where the knowledge of God goes. And that's where the love of Christ develops in your inner man. The outer man is to perish. So I knew immediately what he meant. I had too much of Alan in the way, too much flesh in the way. Now, let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we're going to tackle some of these hard verses today. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In the Body of Christ series, we've been talking about <clears throat> comparing chapter 12, which is a definition of the carnal Christian leader, where God works through him through the gifts, versus chapter 13, in which he wants every believer to come through. And, and to believe God for. It is the more excellent way. <clears throat> we'll start in uh, verse 4. And here he's this, he is describing the love of Jesus. Not love, but the love of Jesus. Not love that you find on this earth, uh, from this earth. Not love of a man or love of a good mother. He's talking specifically about agape love, a love that comes from God and now could grow in you as a fruit from that new nature. Love suffers long and is kind. Verse 4. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. You could say, this is the highest standard of love that there is. See, it thinks no evil. It doesn't just do no evil. It thinks no evil. <clears throat> love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. This is a love of Christ that develops in you as you pray, as you worship, as you obey God, as you meditate, confess the Word of God. You're really developing an avenue of love, a fruit of the love of Christ in you, and giving God more authority to work in your life. Verse 8, love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Now, I taught this in the last, last class, how he's not talking about in heaven, this is all going to vanish away. He's talking about as you mature in love, the love of Christ grows in you and you mature to that love, then he will no longer need to use the giftings of prophecy, uh, of tongues and knowledge to operate through you because you'll have access to the entirety of the Holy Spirit, not just a portion through the giftings. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. And the knowing in part is how much a love do you know is in part. So therefore you're stuck to prophesy only in part because of your immaturity in love. But when that which is perfect has come, meaning when you've matured, when you've grown up in the love of Christ, when you've matured as a uh, mature, complete man or woman of God, then that which is in part will be done away with. Here's, here's the key to, this verse 11 is the key to understanding 1 Corinthians. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Paul here <clears throat> is telling the church, when I was like you, 
when I was a child, I acted like one, I thought like one, I spoke like one. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, I could be a holiness preacher and tell you to quit, start putting away your childish things. Quit acting like that. Quit talking like that. Quit thinking like that. Quit doing that. Quit being like that. Quit understanding like that. Get rid of your, your immature understanding of the Bible. I can say all of those things, but that's not how you quit being a child. You don't quit being a child by putting away childish things. That just means you put them away. You're pretending to be a mature believer. The way you put away childish things, he tells us. I'll read this again. Verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So, so the way to... Put away childish things the the right way, the long lasting way. Now I'm not saying don't quit, don't quit doing things. Like don't keep smoking and drinking and sinning. Saying, oh, when I become a mature believer, I'll quit doing these things. No, you fight those things, you resist those things. But the true way to finally put those things away forever is to become a man or a mature believer. And then you'll find that you'll, you will put away childish things. So the antidote to immaturity, the antidote to childishness, uh, to only being used in part by the Holy Spirit, is to mature, to grow up in the love of God. And in doing that, you'll find that you'll be putting away childish things. For now, verse 12, for now we see in a mirror. There's that word mirror again now. Again, in the King James Version, it says uh, glass. But if you look at the Greek, it means like a mirror. Uh, many, many people preach this as the afterlife. When I, when I, when I uh, get to heaven, I'll understand all the things that happened to me. And that is a truth to that. But that's not what this verse is referring to. For now, we see in a mirror. Now, remember, we just read that in, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And when he's referring to the mirror, he's referring to the transformation and to seeing the nature of God in you. Uh, I'll read it to you, chapter 3, verse 18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. So you, you, you're looking at a reflection and you find within yourself an image, a seed, a nature, um, and that is the glory of the Lord. In fact, let's go up to one more, let's go up to verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That Spirit of the Lord is not talking about uh, when the Holy Spirit falls on a crowd and they get excited and run around free. It's talking about when you were born again, you received the Spirit or the nature of Christ in you and now you are liberated from the nature of sin you no longer have to sin anymore but we all verse 18 with with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the lord so i look at a mirror and i find within me the glory of the lord are being transformed into that same image so i am transforming my life from the image of Christ in me. That image of Christ grows up in my inner man, and I become that person. From glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And since we have this ministry, we don't lose heart. Now back to chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, verse 12 again. For we know... For we, for now we see in a mirror dimly. So now I look, now I look in a mirror, and it's dim. The reflection is dim. There's something in the way. I can't see. You, you think of it like a when you if you get out of the shower and the, and the steam hits the mirror, and and you can see yourself there, but it's hard to see see yourself clearly because there's fog on the mirror. You try to wipe it off, and it keeps fogging up. 
Well, that's kind of what this means, similar. Now, for now, um, we see in a mirror dimly. So when it says now, what does it mean now? Now on this earth? Well, what he's referring to is the reflection that he's done between a mature believer and an immature believer. Back over to chapter uh, 13, 1 Corinthians. And we're going to read about the mirror again. Let's start in verse 12. For now, now I'm going to pause there. For now, what does he mean by for now? Well, he's referring to what he's been teaching, that now as an immature believer, not so much in this time period of your life, but here Paul's comparing himself as an immature believer to a mature believer, as a child to a, a complete, mature believer perfect uh, man. Uh, when I was a child, I acted like a child. For now, in the condition you are, 1 Corinthians church, uh, we see in a mirror. So now in my immaturity, I look in a, at a mirror and I see dimly. Well, dimly means you can't see yourself. Think of maybe when you get out of the shower and all the steam hits the mirror and you're, you're trying to do your hair, but you can't because the, the fog is in there. And you try to get the steam, the, the moisture off the, the mirror so you can see a clear reflection of yourself. This is not talking about heaven. For now, now is in our immaturity, we see in a mirror dimly. But then, when is then? It's not meaning in heaven. It means when I am mature, complete, and perfect. Look at verse 11. We'll read verse 11 and 12 together. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So the comparison is child to man or child to maturity. For now, as a child, I see in a mirror dimly. But then when I am mature, I'll see face to face. So maturity allows you to see face to face who you are. Now, as a child, I know in part. But then, as a mature uh, man or woman, mature person in God, I shall known, uh, know just as I'm also known. Now, to understand this, I think of my time in Nicaragua when the Lord told me there's too much of Alan in the way. And I remember my answer was, God, I don't want ever this to ever happen again. I'm going to do everything I can to never have to give back a sick child to a mother again when I'm representing Jesus. And that, that I believe, is part of why God put me down this path of transformation and, and praying and worshiping and everything we've learned through Pastor Dave Roberson. For now I see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in, I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. So right now I look in the mirror as an immature believer, as a child, uh, as a carnal Christian. I look into the mirror and I look at the reflection and I should see the new nature. And I should see my inner man. But there's something in the way. There's something foggy. There's something making it dim where I cannot quite see who am I. I can't quite see. Maybe, maybe you've had those questions in your own life. Who am I really? One day I'm really nice and kind and gentle, but then the next day I can be cranky and, and not so nice. And, and well, who are you really? I mean, who are you? Well, that's the question. I look in the mirror and I see dimly because of my immaturity. But then when I mature, I'll see face to face. I'll look in the mirror and I'll see clearly the reflection of who God has made me. See, the, the face to face is you looking in the mirror and seeing a reflection of your uh, inner man, the new man. And it is maturing. You'll find that new man looks like Jesus, because it's from the nature of Christ. I look in the mirror and I see a reflection 
and there's nothing in the way. There's no, there's no dim, there's no fogginess. What is the fogginess? It's the outward man. It's the flesh. It's the flesh of Alan that's in the way and is causing me not to see who I really am. It's confusing my life and my situations. It's dulling my faith. It's stopping me from walking in the fullness of Christ. It's allowing me to stay immature. But if I, if I do the ministry of transformation correctly, I am developing the inner man. It is renewed every day and taught every day by the Holy Spirit who I am. And the outward man is, being, is perishing. It is being mortified every day. I no longer am living out of the Alan I was born in my first birth. I'm living out of the child of God I became in my second birth, my new birth, my rebirth. For now, as an immature believer, I look in the mirror and I see dimly. I can't see who I am because there's too much of flesh in the way, too much of Alan. doesn't necessarily mean sin. It doesn't mean smoking and drinking necessarily. It can. But really, it just means everything from my first birth, I need to move out of the way. I need to mortify it so I can grow up and become who I am in my second birth, in my new birth, a child of God. And if I look in that mirror and I see face to face, I'll see that I am like Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm known who, who God has always known me as. The moment I was saved, God looked at me and saw me as his child. I may have looked at me and seen me as my parents' child, Alan Taylor. But God's always seen me since my salvation as a, his child, a child of God. I'll give you a verse in uh, 1 John. Let's go there quick. First John chapter 3. Verse 2. Well, I'll start in verse 1 and read verse 2 and 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. So the moment you're saved, you are a child of God. God looks at you and sees you uh, as His child. He no longer sees you as a child of Adam or a child of your natural family. You were born out of that family and rebirth born again in, as a child of God. So he looks at you and he sees you as his child. You will look at you in the mirror and see the reflection of your flesh of your first birth. And that's what makes it dim. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. So when I'm in heaven and my natural body is on this earth, uh, becoming dirt again, going back to the earth that it came from, I'll be standing right before God without this outward body, uh, and I'll be standing there and I'll realize, hey, I look just like you. I was born of you. My, my mom said one time she went to a, a, a uh, I think it was a funeral of someone who, a friend of hers who passed away. And, and um, someone saw a picture of me. Uh, I think my mom showed another friend of hers a picture of me, her son. And her friend said to my mom, you know, Edie, as long as that boy is alive, you'll never die. And what she meant was that boy looks just like you. I, I can tell he is your son. I can tell he's yours because he looks like you. We don't need to do any DNA testing. We don't need to ask questions. It's very clear that boy came from that woman. Well, that's what this is referring to. When you stand before God, you may look at your life now and say, I'm just a mess. I have so many troubles and struggles. But that's your outward man. That's the outward man that you are to be mortified. Because when that outward man is off of you, either when you die 
or when the trumpet sounds and you're standing before God, you'll look at him, he'll look at you and say, that's my child. Look, we look the same. That's my child. Right now, you look like God. You look like Christ. You are uh, made of him. That is the new man. But you're still wearing this old outward man that's from your first birth. And that's why it says, Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed that we shall be uh, what we shall be. But we know that when, we, when he is revealed, we shall be like him and we shall see him as he is. And then verse 3, Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So First John is referring to, now that you're born again, you look like Jesus on the inside. Your inner man is just like Jesus. It's from the same nature as Christ. And inside of that nature is an image of a fully mature, complete Jesus Christ as he was when he walked on this earth. Complete in love, complete in holiness. That's in you right now, and that is your new man, your inner man as well. And now you're still wearing the old outward body, this flesh. I'm working my way back to 1 Corinthians 13. For now, verse 12, we see in a mirror dimly. So now as an immature believer, a carnal Christian, when I look a, a chapter 12 a believer, I look in the mirror and I see dimly. I can't see who I am because there's too much of my old man in the way. I haven't tried to mortify him. I haven't tried to uh, to stop him. I still think through him, love through him, feel through him, uh, worship through him, and minister through my old outward man. Even though I'm born again, I'm still carnal. I'm still like a baby because I haven't developed the inner man and I've left the outward man to serve God through it. That's the chapter 12 believer. The chapter 13 believer is one where you develop from that new nature. The love of Christ becomes comes forward in you, in your inner man, and it becomes who you are. So now as a child, we look in the mirror and we see dimly because there's too much of Alan in the way as an immature believer. But then if I focus on the ministry of transformation, on developing the love of Christ in me, how through prayer, through worship, through meditating the word of God, through obedience, but then when I look in the mirror, I'll see clearly face to face Jesus in me that I look just like Christ, the new man, the new me that I was born at my salvation, looks like Jesus and has grown and matured to where the world experiences the same love from me that they would have if they met Jesus, the same holiness from me which they would have met if they met Jesus, the same peace from me that they would have experienced if they met with Jesus. Also, the same power of the Holy Spirit through me, through that love, as if they met Jesus Christ on the earth himself. That's a hard saying for the modern church, because the modern church has worked hard at lowering the standard to make you feel good about yourself. That, hey, let's just love each other, let's be nice to each other, Let's just, let's just grow together and be family and, and let's share the love with the world. And there's no, there's very little um, acceptance that, hey, I'm not there yet. I have more to do. God has something for me. Someone said, well, you preach like you're, you're, you're always trying to get somewhere and you're not there. Well, that's the truth. Because if I was there, then, then we'd have a revival. If anyone gets there, we'd have a revival where we'd have Jesus-type meetings where every person would get healed. For now, as an immature believer, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now, I know in part, so as a child, as an immature believer, as a carnal Christian, I'm a chapter 12 believer. Now, I know in part, but then as a chapter 13 believer, 
I shall know just as I also am known. I'll realize and see myself Christ in me. I'll see this is who God has made me and allowed me to grow up to be like Jesus. Look at verse 13. For now and now abide faith, hope, love, these three. So even now in our immaturity, we have access to faith, to hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. If you want to have a ministry, your calling that never fails, it's not going to be through faith. It's not going to be through hope. It's going to be through love. The greatest of these is love. If you want to have all of God, pursue love. Desire the gifts, but pursue the love of God. So again, here's the question. Pastor Allen, I understand I have an outward man and an inward man. I understand that I can develop the love of Christ in me and that will help me to mature uh, so the Holy Ghost can operate completely through me, not just in part, no matter what my calling is. How do I pursue love? Look at chapter 4, 14, verse 1. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. So pursue love, but desire gifts. That's two different things. See, I can desire something. I can desire a, we'll just say a cheesecake. But pursuing it means I go after it. I start planning how to get it. I can desire my wife, Christy, before we were married and say, I like her. I want her. But I had to pursue her. I had to chase her down. I had to win her over. Pursuing means that I, I chase after. That's my direction, uh, my focus, not just a thought, but my focus. And that's what it's saying, that you can desire spiritual giftings. Today, you can have d spiritual giftings operate uh, in your life, even in immaturity. But pursue love. Make that your focus or your ministry. We read in 2 Corinthians. Um, that, that's our ministry to pursue love. How can I get the love of Christ to grow in me, to develop in me? So that's who I am. Well, that's why every sermon I preach, you'll hear in, in all of our messages from the prayer center, uh, from Gary, from, from Bronk, from Jim, Pastor Jim, you'll hear the same from all the group. You'll hear the same uh, tools preached. Pray in tongues. Focus on worshiping, privately worshiping God. Focus on meditating and assimilating and confessing the word of God. And even on fasting. Fasting is a tool to help mortify the flesh. But why do we focus these things? Because we are pursuing love. We're saying, I love that I'm going to heaven. Uh, I love that God uses me today, but there must be more. Because now I look in the mirror and it's still dim. I don't see, see the fullness of Christ operating in my life. I still see sickness, disease around me. I see uh, people who are uh, fighting depression, uh, people who are uh, broken, and I can't get them fixed. I can't see them healed. Even though I prayed, yet there's still people that I pray for that don't get healed. So I, my answer is to pursue the love of Christ. That's the answer. Pursue the love of Christ. It's not to lower the standard and saying, Oh, this is good enough. Praise God, I got this many people healed. And we praise God for the miracles that do happen. We praise God for the answered prayers we do see. But the reason we're pursuing love, the reason why... We don't give up and we keep pressing in. It's because we know there's more. We know there is a ministry of Christ to the world that God is wanting to come to pass for everyone who comes to a man or woman who represents Jesus receives the same uh, result as if Jesus himself was standing, praying for them, ministering to them, counseling them. That is why we're pressing in the transformation and we'll find that our ministry in the body of Christ, the true ministry to the body of Christ, is not through the giftings, 
It's not through the callings. It's through the love of Christ in you that's developed. Let's keep pressing in. There's great things ahead. We're on a wonderful path. Thank you for spending time with me today. I love you and I'll see you soon. God bless you.